I confess, I fantasize about kissing this spectacularly beautiful woman I came with tonight, but I'm pretty sure doing so would be against the rules. Sometimes when she meets my eye, I think she knows what I'm imagining. I want to know what her lips feel like as they melt into mine. Find out what the rules are. Yeah. Yeah, the only way to find that out is to ask, to talk about it. I confess, I fell for a boy during a threesome, and he fell for me too. I still want him to leave his boyfriend for me. It's kind of how negotiate the rules up front before having a threesome is a good way to, you can't stop your feelings, but you know, yeah. I confess, I once broke into a university to have sex with a professor. Standing ovation. I confess, one time my boyfriend and I were having butt sex, like the second time. Long story short, shit literally came out and it was picked up and flung out so I wouldn't notice. I mean, that's sweet, but. Yeah. Hey, hang on, hang on, let me finish, then we can, then no, we can know, talk. The next, mor- the next morning, I asked why shit was on the wall. I mean, what a sweetheart. <laughs> We're just going to leave that right there. Those are your confessions, folks. <laughs> Sex. Almost everybody does it, and almost nobody talks about it, except at Bedpost Confessions, a storytelling show based in Austin, Texas. Whether the stories are funny, informative, political, or completely personal, the anonymous confessions from the audience are the stars of every show. Today's performer is no stranger to the Bedpost stage or community. Adam Maurer, who as an adolescent went on mission trips and led Bible studies, will share a story of misadventures and heartache as a Christian in the closet in St. Adam of Assisi. Adam is a sex-positive licensed counselor and a marriage and family therapist who focuses on everything from your garden variety depression and anxiety to unconventional relationships. In her free time, she enjoys dismantling systems of oppression and twinks with no gag reflex. And just a quick reminder, all Bedpost Storytelling productions are made accessible to the deaf audience members by the fantastic interpreters from Soul Illumination. Though the interpreters are there to serve the deaf, they enthrall the entire crowd with their beautiful expressions of American Sign Language. If you hear a roar of laughter and don't understand why, the interpreter may have stolen the show for a minute. All right, on to Adam's story. Many folks are often surprised when I tell them that I was once a vital part of God's plan to defeat Satan. (laughs) It's shocking, I know. (laughs) He chose me. Uh, In all honesty, I didn't even have sex until I was 21, y'all. I was so deep in the God Squad. I'm talking about praying for the folks in the hallways of my high school, being a missionary, working at Jesus camps deep. (laughs) So how does one go from being a Bible-thumping, cross-wearing Christian to this proud, kinky, queer saint standing in front of you tonight? Well, I'm about to tell you babies all about it. So listen up to the gospel of St. Adam. In the beginning, there was Phyllis and Craig, a couple who hated each other with such enthusiasm that it really made you question God's stance on divorce. They absolutely despised each other, yet somehow managed to beget two children, my older brother Joshua and moi. (laughs) Oh... 
Oh, there we are. I know. How much fucking brown can you get in one goddamn room? <laughs> it looks like a colonoscopy. Had a colonoscopy. <laughs> yeah. It was constantly World War III at our house, so it was really just my older brother and I as a team. He sheltered me from a lot of my parents' chaos. I was grateful to have him. Uh, you know, not only did I have to deal with feuding parents, but I was born too fabulous for this world. <laughs> Obviously. I knew at a young age that I had to hide in order to be safe. I think a part of my brother knew this too. Love you. I love you. Which is why he decided to protect me. One day, after an episode of Unsolved Mysteries that involved a church, my brother asked my mom, hey, why don't we go to church? It turns out my dad was an atheist, but my mom said she would take us because she was raised very religious. My brother wanted to check it out, so I went along, not wanting to leave my protector. We found Williamsburg Christian Church, a non-denominational collection of God's oldest people. I am fairly certain that a number of these folks were actually alive during biblical times. <laughs> it was so strange to go to a shame-based church. They told folks, <laughs> this is what they told them, that they were inherently broken due to sin and they needed rescuing by God, whom they happened to represent. <laughs> Imagine that. All you had to do was give them 10% of your income weekly and pray God didn't punish you for being sinful even though he's all loving and never mind that part about him being all powerful and allowing sin in the world. <laughs> As a kid, it was all very confusing to me. My mom signed us up to be a part of the live nativity, the first Christmas at the church. Every year church members put on a whitewashed version of the birth of Christ. They would drag out these brightly colored colored poly Brent blend costumes that reeked of mold and mothballs. Members of the church would stand in a makeshift manger so passing cars could witness the glorious tableau of Christ being born. <laughs> this budget nativity was supposed to get people to give their lives to Christ or some shit. <laughs> I don't exactly know what their game plan was on this. Like, people would be driving down the road at 40 miles per hour <laughs> and have a religious experience. I mean, can you imagine? You're just driving down the street and you see us and you say to yourself, man, I got to stop fucking my wife's sister. <laughs> Anywho, this particular Christmas Eve, my mother was the only woman signed up to be a part of the nativity who was under 80. The Golden Girls were passing out coffee and cookies. <laughs> That's what they called themselves. Passing out coffees and cookies to folks inside where it was warm. And about an hour and a half after gazing into the eyes of a Cabbage Patch kid that represented our Lord and Savior, my mother looked up to me, Gabriel, the angel on the haystack, and then she did something that would forever alter my life. Adam, I'm freezing. I need a break. She whispered in case some car was barreling towards our scene with its lights off. She was never one to miss a soul. Will you play Mary for a bit? <laughs> well, I rushed inside and I threw on that costume in a flash. <laughs> I shooed her away and tried to emulate all the Miss America contestants I had ever seen. Shoulders back, a poised smile, as I admired my cabbage patch Christ with pride. <laughs> it wasn't until later on in life as an adult I would recognize this was my first time in drag. <laughs> Weirdly enough, this was not the only time that I did drag at this church. 
they had a program for kids my age where we could, uh, which was run by Miss Cindy. <laughs> I fucking loved Miss Cindy. She was a road hard, put away wet kind of woman. She looked like Joan Jett with cheaper makeup. <laughs> Looking back, I totally know why I felt so close to her. She saw me hiding my sexuality and completely embraced me, the new sissy boy in her class. She laughed at my jokes, and she always let me be on the girls' team during any of the games. Once, she showed me her armadillo tattoo on the outer part of her upper thigh. A way to let me know that she was a badass bitch who fucking hated shame, too. Miss Cindy once picked a play for us kids to perform in front of the whole congregation. It was called Here Comes the What, a short one act centered on low hanging jokes about an unattractive bride. Guess who she picked to play the bride? <laughs> that delicious bitch. <laughs> God, I love her so much more now as an adult. Not only did she embrace my queerness, she put it on fucking display at that church. My brother played my father, and I got to wear my mother's actual wedding dress in church. <laughs> this all happened in the church that made sure to tell me about the shame I should feel. My sin was vague. It was never named directly. I was often told that I was too outgoing, which come to find out is low-key old person for being a faggot. <laughs> Things were great between my older brother and I until he hit puberty. That's when all the rage of the household got poured into me via my brother's fist and hateful words. As part of his rebellion, he quit his job as my protector. You are so fucking weird, Adam. You're the reason mom and dad hate each other. Now that kind of abuse is tough to cope with as a kid, but it's even more challenging when you are so fucking weird. <laughs> there was no easily accessible resources to help me understand myself back then. It was the early 90s, pre-internet, so my only understanding of gay culture came from TV. The AIDS crisis dominated the nightly news, so I thought being gay meant I was going to die of AIDS. I also thought it meant I had to like fucking paint murals and like <laughs> sew a quilt. <laughs> Again, it was all really murky to me. Church had started off as a safe haven for me, a place to be accepted just by following simple rules. And not only did I find validation for being good, one of the rules was not to engage in sexual activity, a perfect cover for not being romantically interested in girls. As my home life got more chaotic, I clung to being a good boy in church. And that worked until my brother's teenage rebellion led him to bringing alcohol on a youth group trip and a falling out with the church. He stopped going, so I did as well. Our mom continued to go. My dad continued to sleep in on Sundays. And suddenly, I was alone. My brother's friends would come over to the house, and for the first time, I would be locked out of his room and left to face my parents' never-ending contempt, all the while trying to conceal my toxic shame. The prodigal daughter returns. After my brother and I left the church, things got more volatile between my parents. We eventually moved to a new neighborhood, and by, by that time, my brother took me back under his wing before he went to college. After being abused by my brother, I clung to being whoever anyone thought I should be, just to survive. I constantly looked outside of myself for validation because I knew that what was inside of me was absolutely not acceptable. I hid my secret deep within me just about as deep as I hit the wrestling magazines I would steal from the high school's library under my bed. <laughs> it was now the late 90s, and the evangelical movement was all around me. 
Kids in my high school were witnessing to me daily, and when I entered my junior year, I hit a low point. I hated myself as much as my parents hated each other. No one really knew the real me, including myself. The real kicker was that I could not accept any validation I got from others because they didn't give it to me. They gave it to the person I was pretending to be. I was bitter and angry at the world, and after one particularly bad run of luck, the cutest, most charming boy invited me for the millionth time to his youth group, and I said yes. His church seemed accepting, and that first night I went, I dedicated my life to Christ. Magically, <laughs> things seemed to get better, which I, of course, attributed to the Lord. <laughs> uh, looking back now as an adult, I now realize that my Savior happened to appear right as I was getting out of my first major depressive episode. And then, coincidentally, a week after dedicating my life to Christ, my mom broke the news that she was finally leaving my dad, and we moved out. My prayers were answered. <laughs> well, most of them, anyway. I was still pleading with God to fix my sexuality. For a brief time, I convinced myself that it would be okay for me to be gay as long as I thought only about Jesus when I masturbated. <laughs> Dead. You see them on that cross with those abs. You know what I'm talking about. I would concentrate on how much the Lord loved me as I rubbed one out. After a year of being the best born again Christian I could be, I worked up the courage to confess to one of the youth pastors that I was gay. They laid hands on me anointed me with peppermint oil, and spoke in tongues as they tried to pray my gay away. <laughs> it didn't take. <laughs> Two weeks later, I was weeping as I jerked off to my collection of pilfered wrestling magazines. I was crushed. I figured I didn't love God enough, so he didn't fix me. I had told my shameful secret to one of the only places that made me feel safe and lovable. And instead, instead of embracing me, they rejected me. So one night when I was 16 and my mom was visiting her boyfriend's house in another state, I made the decision to kill myself. Hmm. That night, I lay on the floor sobbing, ripped apart, but something within me refused to die. Because I'm the new Lazarus bitch. <laughs> the beautiful thing about going to the edge of death and surviving was the amount of fucks I brought back with me which was exactly zero. After surviving my secret suicide attempt, I started to slowly change. Suddenly, I realized that God didn't just love me as he arbitrarily loved everyone, including Hitler and Paula Deen. I mean, she's racist, come on. But he actually liked me just as I was. I thought if everyone is a reflection of God, then that means God is both masculine and feminine. Which meant I'm the most like God because I'm both too. Eventually, in college, I would accept myself fully. And just like Miss Cindy taught me to do, I made Christians deal with my sexuality. Some, some were great. They challenged themselves to re-examine their own beliefs. Others, others tried to stifle me. Like my young life, young life boss at camp who told me I would have to go to counseling if I wanted to keep my job. It just goes to show even the body of Christ has an asshole. <laughs> mm -hmm. What I realize now, 16 years out of the closet is that I represent the only threat to shame that there is. 
and that's pride. Shame cannot exist in the presence of pride. Pride is such a challenge to shame that it was declared one of the seven deadly sins. The worst, according to some, because it leads to all the other sins. It's the sin of Lucifer, the fallen angel, who also refused to see himself as less than. Shame-based religions require folks to buy into the notion that they are broken at birth which many people are willing to do for a sense of security in a chaotic world. Individuals like me and a number of y'all who have worked hard to accept and love the best and the most challenging bits of ourselves, we buck that system. Shame-based religions vilify some folks and paint them as less than to relieve the discomfort believers experience when they are, those participate in uh, more common discrepancies, such as divorce or infidelity. So people who live a sex-positive life, who participate in relationships beyond monogamy, or who simply live beyond the binary concept of gender, we all get lumped together as heathens who actively choose to sin against God daily. The believers' shortcomings are more easily dismissed because they are seen as a one-time indiscretion and thus forgivable. Some folks are just willing to forego empathy and understanding to hold tightly to the illusion of security. But I'm here to tell you tonight, you are wonderful just as you are. You are a work of art as well as a masterpiece in the making. Shame almost killed me once, and it truly was a gift. It taught me what I'm worth, which is fucking everything. It taught me which I, what I am, which is a tough cookie. So don't fuck with me. It taught me how to truly live life on my own terms which is to live each day brimming with pride. Thank you, y'all. I confess I was a virgin until 31. At 31 and a half, I found myself in the BDSM community as a switch and spent most of 2017 in Austin Dungeons. Anybody need a good dungeon? I know where to find one. I confess. I love being forced into a little space and then being shamed for it. I might be daddy's sweet little girl, but sometimes I'm his dumb one, too. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Is that your confession, too? Also, okay. Okay, front row. You're feeling it. I confess, we're newlyweds. We're ready for our next threesome. Wedding present? Question mark. <laughs> Definitely put that on the registry. Yes. Make sure you wrap in a bow. I confess, I like it in and around the butthole. End of story. <laughs> Love the specificity. <laughs> I confess that I really should have masturbated before this because I'm dripping. Mm. Gotta say, if you, even if you had had a wank, you probably still would be. Do it again. Those were your confessions. Thank you so much. You're very well spoken. Bebo's Confessions is recorded in front of a live audience at the North Door in Austin, Texas. To view upcoming show dates, submit your confession to us, or to snag an I Confess t-shirt, tote, or journal, visit bevosconfessions.com. Follow Bebo's Confessions on Instagram and Facebook for more anonymous audience confessions, behind-the-scenes shenanigans, and snapshots of Bebo's Confessions performers and their stories. Links to Adam's social and all things bedposter in the show notes. 
That Post Confessions is produced by myself, Sadie Smythe, and Miranda Wiley. Our podcast production team is Mariah Gossett, Mike Moody, and Permanent Record Studios. Don't forget to subscribe and maybe give us that five-star review if you're enjoying the show. Keep confessing. <laughs>